This is Christy Bell. I'm the training coordinator here in the Office of Training and Exercises at the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. We're pleased to welcome all of you to this afternoon's webinar, Understanding Tornadoes, Microbursts, and Downbursts. Before we get started, you'll notice we're presenting in a different format than we have sometimes in the past. Um, Bill prefers to use the Share My Desktop view, so the desktop you're seeing is Bill's desktop. Uh, to see both the list of participants and the chat box on your screen, you need to click the drop-down menu, which is located in the middle of your screen at the top. You can click on the participant list, and it'll pop up for you, and then the chat buttons, and then just drag them to where you want them on, on your screen. Due to the number of callers, we'll be muting all participant lines during the session. If you have questions during the presentation, please do ask them. We just ask that you do so via the chat feature. Simply type them in, and they'll be answered in the same format. If you'd rather ask your questions or make your comments verbally, we ask that you hold those until Bill takes a break for questions or until the end. I'll ask you to raise your hand using the raise hand button located directly below the list of participants, and then I'll recognize you individually and ask that individual only to unmute their line using pound six. And I'll cover that again when we get to a question point. At the end, there'll be an opportunity to provide feedback to include suggestions for topics, and we very much appreciate yours. The session will be recorded, and a link will be provided to all registered participants to view the recorded session. To introduce our presenter for today, Bill Samler is the external liaison at the National Weather Service Wakefield Office, which serves Central and Eastern Virginia, Northeast North Carolina, and the Lower Maryland and Eastern Shore. He coordinates with state and local emergency managers, state agencies, the media, and other National Weather Service customers to ensure nat National Weather Service products and services meet their needs. Bill participates in a number of training initiatives, including community emergency response team CERT training and assists with a variety of weather-related exercises. Bill came to Wakefield in April 1994 after spending the first 10 years of his 30-year National Weather Service career at the National Severe Storms Forecast Center in Kansas City, Missouri, now the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, issuing nationwide forecasts for severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. He's received several awards, including the 2005 National Hurricane Conference Outstanding Achievement Award in Meteorology. A native of southern New Jersey, Bill and his family live near Petersburg, Virginia. He has a BS in Meteorology from Rutgers University and an MS in Meteorology from St. Louis University. Bill, take it away. Great. Thank you, Christy, and good afternoon, everyone. And I uh, want to start by thanking VDEM for graciously allowing uh, us as, as uh, weather service offices to uh, do these webinars. Uh, I think they've been uh, really informative. I know uh, myself and, and my counterparts in Blacksburg and Sterling have enjoyed both putting them together and, and uh, uh, hosting, well, not hosting them, but, but actually uh, doing them. And I hope you find this one uh, informative and useful as well. And for those of you that went through the webinar that uh, I did back I think it was in uh, uh, the summer or early fall last year on the derecho back in 2012. You'll see a couple of slides in here that um, look familiar to you because I'm going to borrow some of that information from uh, uh, to put into this webinar. But we're going to kind of take a scientific look at uh, tornadoes and, and other severe thunderstorm phenomenon um, as opposed to maybe looking at it from an impact perspective. So, um, you know, at some point, uh, if there's interest, we might want to look at it from an impact perspective and a damage survey perspective. But for today, we're going to uh, talk about it from a science perspective. So let me get my slide to change here. I want to start by giving you the National Weather Service definition of a severe thunderstorm. And, and I do that because I think from a personal perspective, uh, all of us have our own definition of what a severe thunderstorm is. But when you hear severe thunderstorm warning or tornado warning, I think it's important to remember that there's really only two types of phenomenon that warrant the issuance of a severe thunderstorm or tornado warning. The first is hail. And that would be hail the size of a quarter or larger. And then the other are wind phenomenon, whether it's straight line wind that's strong enough to produce damage. The, the technical meteorological uh, sort of uh, threshold that we use is 50 knots or 58 miles an hour, which that 50 knots is actually a throwback uh, to the 1950s 
uh, and the Air Force, which actually initiated that 50 knot criteria um, because of that was at the point where um, there was sustained or there was potential damage to aircraft. Uh, but we normally look at the severe thunderstorm wind portion of the definition by whether there was damage, trees down, power lines down, structural damage, and then secondly, whether or not there was a tornado. Uh, I get a lot of questions and, and have over the years about the pressure difference between inside and outside the tornado. And while there can be a significant pressure difference, it's not enough to do damage. The damage that we see uh, post-tornado is all due to wind forces. So in, in, uh, to, to sort of boil it down uh, simply, the severe thunderstorm definition really only has two parts, a hail part and a wind part. So when we talk about thunderstorms in general, we need to think about them in terms of why do they form? What are the characteristics within the uh, environment that we're in that allows thunderstorms to develop? Well, obviously, in order to get clouds, you have to have moisture. So moisture is key, along with something that we call instability. And a baseline definition for the atmosphere to be unstable is, can a parcel of layer if it starts to rise, continue to rise? And if the answer to that question is yes, then the atmosphere is unstable. If that parcel can only rise a short distance and then will no longer be able to rise, or it can't rise at all, then the atmosphere is stable. And for those of you that uh, attended the uh, webinar I did on the derecho back in 2012, you might remember a uh, acronym called CAPE, which stands for Convective Available Potential Energy, and I will uh, go into a little more detail of that in a second. But that is the primary uh, parameter that we use to analyze whether or not the atmosphere is unstable or not. The second piece is some sort of forcing mechanism. In other words, what in the atmosphere might drive the air to be forced upward? And the most common forcing mechanism is a front, typically a cold front or a warm front. If we were, instead of uh, in Virginia, if we were out in Texas, especially if we were in a place like Amarillo or Lubbock or Midland, uh, we'd more often talk about the dry line, uh, which is a dew point boundary, but a significant boundary for them when it comes to not only thunderstorm development, but severe thunderstorm development. And then the other piece of that forcing is there are features that traverse the atmosphere um, that have rotation to them, and that rotation on a fairly large scale, whether it be on a state scale or a multi-state scale, uh, causes the atmosphere to rise. And so those are the primary for forcing mechanisms that we deal with. And then the last one, and it kind of goes to the forcing mechanism piece, is how do the wind fields look? Uh, is there a crossing between what's going on in the low levels in terms of the direction and speed of the wind and what's going on in the upper levels? And then the last one, uh, and one that you don't hear talked about a whole lot anymore because we've gotten to focus a lot more on the lower levels and the middle levels of the atmosphere, is what's going on aloft. Are the winds, in terms of direction and speed, diverging? And that divergence can lead to upward motion uh, and ultimately severe weather as well under the right conditions. So I want to go back and, and, and talk about uh, CAPE like I did uh, with the June uh, 2012 derecho. And the two graphics that you're seeing here are weather balloon observations. And these plots uh, are available from the Storm Prediction Center. Those of you that uh, frequent our office's briefing page, if you go to the severe thunderstorm section, um, you'll be able to see images of these for the five weather balloon observation sites we have surrounding our area of responsibility. And to, just to go over what you see plotted, um, and I'm going to concentrate on uh, the three lines that go upward. The green line is dew point. That's a measure of moisture in the atmosphere. The red line is temperature. And then the dark red line that you see that's dotted is what I'm going to call a parcel trajectory. And the way to understand that is if you were to take an air parcel and take it up through its path vertically in the atmosphere, uh, how far would it go in the vertical? And so uh, if it doesn't go very far, 
where, in other words, if it crosses this red line and goes to the left of the red line, then the atmosphere is stable. But if it continues to go as it does in the image that you see me pointing out on the left-hand side, then the atmosphere is unstable. So those are the kind of things that we look for. And when we talk about Kate, which is available potential energy, if any of you have done any uh, math, you might have heard the area under the curve. Well, if we draw a curve between the temperature line, this light red line here, and the darker red line, which is the partial trajectory, and you color in that area, that area under the curve is what we call Kate. And it's the energy available for an atmospheric parcel to rise. The bigger the number, the better. And although I don't have it written here as a general rule, in, in Virginia, you get above about 2,000 and you become favorable for severe thunderstorms. You can have values as little as 500 or 1,000 and get some thunderstorm activity, but rarely do you see severe thunderstorm activity in Virginia unless you get uh, atmospheric instability or CAPE to be above that 2,000 threshold. But if we look at the values that we see for uh, the uh, June 29th, the ratio, you see some pretty extreme values, especially on the right side, where now you're seeing values between 5,000 and almost 7,000. And those values are extremely rare. Maybe once or twice a year do we see values close to this uh, in Virginia. It's a little bit more common if you go out into the Plains, Oklahoma, Texas, even Kansas, once in a while Missouri, you might see values 5,000 or greater, uh, but this is really a rare event, and, and it's kind of an extreme situation, and obviously we ended up with an extreme event on the derecho of June 29, 2012, but I just want to illustrate for you what we're talking about when we talk about uh, CAPE. And so again, the bigger the value, the better. So let's talk about uh, the forcing mechanisms, and I'm going to talk about warm fronts and cold fronts. And the way to define the two is if you think about how the atmosphere is moving in terms of what air is moving into a region and trying to displace another. And in a cold front, it's cold air that's trying to displace warm air. And cold air being more dense or heavier is uh, fairly efficient at moving warm air out of the way because warm air is uh, lighter and less dense. And if you look at the shape of this front being fairly steep uh, in the vertical, you can envision the fact that as this front moves into the warmer air, it, the, uh, that warmer air has got to go somewhere and it gets lifted. And it tends to lift fairly rapidly. The stronger the front, the faster moving the front, in many cases the stronger the uh, vertical motion and the better chance you have for thunderstorms. And as we all know, with cold fronts, both the weather changes and the pressure changes uh, can be fairly rapid and dramatic. And so to put it into motion, this kind of gives you a sense of what happens physically in the atmosphere during a cold front. You can see the cold air just kind of bullies its way, for lack of a better word, uh, into the warm air and forces it upward. And if the atmosphere has enough moisture and instability, that rapid motion in the vertical can cause thunderstorms and uh, occasionally severe thunderstorms. Warm fronts are another lifting mechanism, but since you have warm air trying to displace cold air, uh, there's not nearly as efficient a process in the atmosphere to do that. And so instead of warm air being able to uh, kind of bully its way and push cold air out of the way, it's got to erode the cold air from the top. So it gradually starts eroding it from the top and eventually, although in many cases slowly, uh, gets down to the surface. And so the, the warm front uh, takes its time being able and typically is a slower moving boundary than a cold front because it's got a lot more work to do. As a result, you'll notice that the slope of the front is a lot less steep. And so the vertical motions are less dramatic, and we tend not to get a lot of thunderstorm activity along warm fronts, but in the summertime we certainly can, because the atmosphere uh, is unstable south of where the warm front is, and some of that air is getting lifted above the front. So it's not uncommon 
uh, especially in the spring and summer months, to have some thunderstorm activity embedded with the stable precipitation to the north of a warm front. And again, just to kind of get that illustration of what's going on, you can see that the vertical motions are less dramatic, they're more gentle, and as a result, the cloud depth typically isn't as great. But it can be if the air being uh, risen and uh, rising above that uh, colder air is unstable. All right. So let's move on to some severe thunderstorm types. There are really uh, two types, although I have three here. You have single cells, and we'll talk about supercells specifically uh, in a couple of minutes. And then you have multiple cells that group themselves together. And I have lines separated from clusters, but they can both be considered uh, multi-cell uh, formations. A uh, line of thunderstorm is just a multi-cell formation that's oriented itself in the line, and then you can have multi-cell clusters of thunderstorms that oftentimes have a egg-shaped or a circular shape to them and, and are a little bit different from the squall line piece. So I want to spend a fair amount of time talking about supercell thunderstorms because even though they're relatively rare here in Virginia, and, and if we were to look at their percentage as a whole in terms of all the thunderstorm activity that occurs across the U.S., probably less than 20% of all thunderstorms are supercell thunderstorms. But why they're important is two reasons. One is probably more than 70% of the time supercell thunderstorms are severe, producing one or more of the phenomenon we've talked about. And then secondly, if that supercell is tornadic, in many cases, they're the storms responsible for the stronger tornadoes that we see, uh, the EF2 tornadoes all the way up to the EF5 tornadoes. Now, they can produce weaker, thunder, weaker tornadoes, but by and large, those stronger tornadoes that we hear about on the news and, and see damage of are typically the result of uh, supercell thunderstorms. And if you look at them on radar, and I'll show you an image of this in a little bit, the, the classic feature is something called a hook echo that I, is illustrated here on the right, and I'll actually show you a better uh, picture with a hook embedded on it in a, in a few minutes. But that area here, just in, in the picture to the top right here, um, just to the south of where the bend in the hook is, or just to the east of where the bend in the hook is, is what we call a weak echo region. And I want to talk about that by looking at the uh, storm uh, that we had that produced the Cherry Stone tornado back in July of last year. And I want to look at that storm in the vertical. So what we're looking at is we're taking a slice through that thunderstorm, and what does it look like from a radar perspective as we go up in the atmosphere? And this is uh, just after 8 o'clock in the morning. The storm is just barely onto the Chesapeake Bay. It's really a pretty nondescript storm, uh, nothing particularly exciting about it at this point. Um, the max top with the storm is somewhere around 40 to 50,000 feet, so it's fairly high up in the atmosphere, but there's nothing in the vertical yet that really has one concerned. But if we go 10 minutes later, one of the things that you notice is that there is a lot more uh, intense echo, say in that uh, 15 to 25 or 30,000 foot range. And that's the beginning signs that that storm is really becoming intense and in some cases may be a hail producer. And when we talk about a weak echo region, the beginning of that weak echo region, interestingly enough, is not going to be here where the echo reaches all the way to the ground. It's going to be just, uh, in this case, downwind or downstream of that in this area here. And I'll put an arrow on the next image to illustrate on radar where that weak echo region is. And so if we go just nine more minutes later, what you notice is how much of the echo with this storm is way up above 20,000 feet. This point, which is just off of the uh, eastern shore, that storm is severe at this point. There's no question um, the area where the atmosphere went below freezing is probably in the 13 to 14,000 foot range. So it's right in here, and there's an awful lot of ice 
above that zone. So there's a very intense storm, uh, lots of ice. The storm is probably starting to produce hail now if it hasn't already uh, produced it for a couple of minutes anyway. And where I have that arrow is the portion of the echo that we would call the weak echo region. And you can see that even though it doesn't look all that intense near the ground, there's a lot going on above it. And then about the time that the storm made landfall on the eastern shore, you really get a sense of where the weak echo region is. If we look at the very surface part of this, it's right down in here, uh, just to the southeast of where the heaviest uh, portion of the echo at the ground is. And so you've got hail forming here. Uh, you've got hail falling down through the cloud here. You've got really a storm that's way above 50,000 feet in terms of its top. And so we look at this as, as really almost the classic supercell thunderstorm and one that produced, um, if you uh, had the chance last week at the Virginia Emergency Management uh, Symposium or have had a chance to look at our post-storm report, it produced not only a tornado, but it produced a lot of wind damage and some really big hail. So that just gives you a sense of what we mean when we talk about a weak echo region. And really one of the best examples uh, in the last few years was the Cherry Stone tornado last year. So to, to get back and talk about supercell thunderstorms from a radar perspective, here's kind of an old storm. This produced a killer tornado. Uh, in in northwest part of Hanover County back in 1998. And what I've done is I've overlaid a fish hook on that echo. And this is the hook echo that I talked about a few minutes ago. And you might think if I were to take this arrow, this white arrow off, you might look at that echo and say, well, there's really nothing going on there. But if we look at the velocity data, the actual Doppler portion of Doppler radar, we can really see that there's a lot of velocity, um, both inbound, what we call inbound and outbound, uh, occurring right underneath where that hook, bend in that hook is. And so what we've got here is we've got a circulation. And you, you might say, now wait a second, whoa, 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 you haven't really uh, explained enough to give me that sense that you've got a circulation. The wind data that we see from the radar is what we call one-dimensional. We either see motion away from the radar, and with the radar and these, both of these images being down off of the bottom right corner of the image. So away from the radar would be motion that you see in red, and toward the radar would be motion that you see in green. So if you you need to use your imagination a little bit, but when you have motion away from the radar and toward the radar close together, it takes a little bit of imagination, but you can see that there is rotation in that storm. And while not all uh, rotations produce tornadoes, that's the key piece of information that we look for on radar to try to identify storms that might be tornadic. And the important thing to remember is in most cases when we're dealing with a supercell thunderstorm, we're dealing with this weak echo region uh, part of that hook echo in the supercell. So here's an even more dramatic situation. This is one from uh, Louisville about three years ago. Uh, you can see how dramatic that hook echo is. And if we were to uh, look at this from the standpoint of a typical low pressure area, if we had enough data available to us, we could actually see that in the center of that hook there's an L, the warm front being or stationary front, depending upon the situation, to the east, and then a cold front associated with the outflow with that storm extending down to the southwest. And so we can actually draw small fronts even with a single thunderstorm. But you can see how dramatic underneath that weak echo region the winds are with this tornado. And I think this was an EF4 tornado, if I remember correctly. And so you can see that the velocity difference uh, in this situation was even more dramatic than what we saw uh, in the Hayden, or not the Haydensville tornado. I forget the name of the town in Hanover that that uh, tornado occurred, but in the uh, previous slide. So this was even a much stronger circulation than the previous one. So again, just to sort of reiterate, uh, what we were talking about in terms of being able to see on radar the circulations, here's uh, a couple of 
uh, different depictions of the same event. This happens to be the Suffolk Tornado Day back in 2008. Here's rotation uh, down here in Brunswick County. Uh, there was a tornado with this particular rotation uh, north of Lawrenceville or, or, and, and extended east of Lawrenceville in Brunswick County. And then there were two additional uh, circulations, one in the northwest part of Surrey County and then this one down here, which was actually uh, the Suffolk tornado uh, down here to the southeast. So uh, we can have multiple rotations on radar at the same time, but the same principle exists, that you have motion away from the radar and motion toward the radar very t close together. And the more intense the difference in rotation or the difference in velocity between the incoming and outgoing, the better chance you have of a tornado and chances are that tornado is going to be more intense. So here's uh, this is imagery from the Gloucester tornado back in 2011, and this is going to be a little bit hard for you to see, but I want to start by concentrating on the big oval that you see uh, in the center part of both of these images. What you'll see is a cell that comes in from the southwest, there it is, and it works its way all the way up into the bay at the end of this loop. If you look at the rotation, and I know it moves pretty fast, but if you look at the rotation, that rotation is persistent all the way through this loop. That storm is the Gloucester tornado storm. Uh, killed, uh, I think, three people uh, in Gloucester and actually had its genesis uh, down in the Raleigh area associated with the Raleigh tornado that same day. The other storm I want to pay attention to is this one about a third of the way through the loop that comes up into this smaller oval right here and extends out and ends up uh, in the southwest part of Chesapeake at the end of the loop. This particular storm, if you look closely, actually has a stronger rotational couplet with it. And that storm produced a uh, EF3 tornado, same intensity, although a little bit stronger uh, EF3 in the northeast part and central part of Bertie County, North Carolina, uh, that killed a dozen people, occurred on the same day. Not exactly the same time, but pretty close. So, tropical tornadoes. Uh, because we can get tornadoes during hurricanes and tropical storms, um, we tend not to get as... Uh, they, they tend not to occur with every single tropical storm. They tend to be weaker in most cases than typical tornadoes that uh, we've shown you already. Um, the circulations can be really short-lived. It can be very difficult to warn for these tornadoes because the circulations are short-lived. The other aspect of tropical tornado circulations is instead of a typical supercell thunderstorm where the rotation starts in the 10 to 20,000 foot level within the atmosphere and works its way down to the ground, the circulations in tropical tornadoes tend to start very close to the ground uh, and never get very deep. Rarely do they get above, say, 10 or 15,000 feet deep. Uh, so they can be a real challenge uh, for us. And as I said, some uh, tropical systems produce uh, more tornadoes than others. So the last one that we had to produce uh, tornadoes was Irene back in 2011. And you can see a couple of rotational couplets here. This is Virginia Beach. For those of you not familiar with the geography, that dot is at Sandbridge. And we're starting clockwise around with the lowest elevation going up 2,500 feet, going up 4,000 feet, and then going up 6,000 feet. And you will notice that the, uh, the actual rotation piece is strongest near the ground and weakens as you go up. And that's typical of tropical tornado storms. And you can see that there are multiple uh, rotational couplets, uh, but not all of them produce tornadoes. It just turns out that this first one that's strongest uh, produced a fairly weak tornado in the Sandbridge area. 
Now, not all radar signatures produce tornadoes, and this is where, from a forecaster perspective, it can get you to pull your hair out. These are all rotational signatures from the Suffolk tornado back in 2008. And if uh, we were in a, a live audience here where uh, I was speaking to you in a room, um, I always ask the question, which two don't? And it's really hard to sort of pick out which two of these rotational signatures don't produce tornadoes, but there are two of them that don't. And the two that don't are in the bottom left and the top right. And if I go back just a little bit and show you those two images, you can see that, that they look just as strong, if not stronger, than this one down here in the bottom right and this one down here in the bottom center, but yet neither of them produce tornadoes. And in fact, the rotational signature with that storm lasted for about 90 minutes. And we warned on that rotational signature the entire time. And remember, this is within the context of a day when we had a dozen tornadoes total, and we got not even a report of a funnel cloud. Uh, with that particular storm. So it kind of gives you a sense that even with the best possible information that we have, it's not always a one-to-one -one relationship between seeing that rotation on radar and a, and a tornado being produced. So I'm going to focus most of the rest of the time here on uh, squall lines. They tend to be a lot more frequent than supercell thunderstorms. Uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 days a year, somewhere in the Commonwealth are lines of thunderstorms that, that uh, may or may not produce wind damage. Uh, the damage that's produced tends to be on the leading edge. They can move really quickly. If you were to look at, for example, the uh, derecho back in 2012, there were times when that derecho moved in excess of 60 miles an hour. So their forward speed can often be uh, quite fast. It can be relatively slow. You can have lines of thunderstorms that move 15 or 20 miles an hour, and you can have them that move 70 or 75 miles an hour. But the ones that are severe, more often than not, are moving pretty quickly. And then the classic radar signature that we look for is called a bow echo. And here's another oldie but goodie, and I really like this particular image because it was one of the first events uh, that we had as an office uh, that had really dramatic uh, wind damage associated with it, but it was a winter event. You can see that it was the first week in January back in 1995, and it was one of those events where down here across northeast North Carolina and Hampton Roads, it was in the 60s, but it never got out of the 30s in Richmond. And so while there was thunder as this squall line moved through Richmond, there was no wind damage because it was so cold near the surface and the winds aloft could never get down to the ground. But you can see the uh, little line segments in here and each of them have these little bowed areas in here that are typically the uh, locations where uh, enhanced wind damage is possible. And if we uh, take off the... Uh, precipitation intensity and go to the wind information and look at the Doppler velocity, there's a couple of things that we can see. One is we can see this line that comes down through here that I have highlighted in white. That's actually the squall line, and we can see it in the wind field because there's a change in direction of the winds associated with that squall line. In this case, the winds were strong southerly ahead of the squall line, and westerly or west-northwesterly behind the squall line. So the squall line could actually be picked out within the Doppler velocity information uh, just by looking at that change in wind direction. And then along and just behind the line where the radar is looking uh, parallel to the direction uh, that the wind is blowing, we can actually see the magnitude of the winds. And in some cases, we're talking about winds that are 60 to 80 miles an hour embedded within uh, and just behind uh, the squall line. So pretty impressive uh, wind event uh, for early morning hours any time of year, let alone the first week in January. And I said we'd, we'd use some more depictions of the derecho in 2012, and here's another depiction 
uh, of the squall line. This is the derecho that uh, uh, we talked about and that uh, we experienced here in Virginia and, and really for a large part of the Ohio Valley all the way to the Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey coasts. And you can see how uh, well developed it is, but eventually as you begin to see the winds and you can see it sort of in the echo, the the storms try to keep up with the winds. When it, when that happens, the echo begins to weaken. So let's look at it from the Sterling radar, and we're going to take both the precipitation intensity perspective and the wind perspective and put them side by side. And I want to focus on the right graphic for a second because you're going to see uh, the winds as they come in toward the radar, they're going to be inbound, so they're going to be denoted on the left-hand side of this scale. But as the squall line moves away from the radar, the winds are going to shift to the right side of the scale in terms of their coloring. That's because the motion is away from the radar. And you can see that happen here now where the winds that we're actually seeing are outbound. They're moving away from the radar. That's the actual downburst wind uh, that we're seeing uh, with that squall line. And you can see as the squall line approaches, you have this large area of winds that look to be in excess of uh, 70 miles an hour headed toward the radar. And then as it passes the radar, you can see that they stay about the same intensity, but the motion is away from the radar. Really very impressive situation in terms of being able to give you a sense of what it looks like on radar as uh, an intense squall line is approaching. If we take an individual storm, once in a while you can sort of have a bow echo evolve from an individual storm, and that individual storm can take on a kidney shape at first, and then as winds on the back side of the storm get uh, sort of intertwined in the circulation of the storm, the storm itself begins to bow out. And it's along anywhere along this bow where you can get significant wind damage. And we had an event like that um, back in, and, and, you know, I almost hate to go back to uh, events that are almost, in this case, 20 years old, but they're some of the better events that we've seen. Um, this was an event back in middle of June, back in 98. This storm... Uh, got going out around Raleigh, and within about two hours, it had made its way into uh, Hampton Roads. So you're talking about moving somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 65 miles an hour. And the, initially, the storm had a kidney, be sh kidney bean-shaped look. But as it started accelerating, it started getting this kind of S-shape to it with this very intense bow uh, that you can see depicted in this white line here. And right behind that bow, you can see the wind velocity data here. And I don't have the uh, scale on here, but if I were to have the scale on here, this sort of fuchsia, fuchsia color or rose color uh, is actually winds in excess of 60 to 70 miles an hour. Uh, and this was an event where we did have one death in the Norfolk area uh, where a tree fell on someone. From a visual clue, um, one of the things that really defines or denotes a squall line is something called a shelf cloud. And from a pure circulation perspective, this you can actually sort of use this as the leading edge of a front because uh, ahead of this shelf cloud, the air is typically warm, unstable, and moist. Just behind and underneath this shelf cloud, the winds change direction, the temperature drops off, and the winds increase, in many cases, pretty dramatically. So from a physical perspective, you really have uh, two things going on. You have wind going up into the cloud. This warm air is being lifted up into the storm. And if you want to think of the sort of the ramp-like approach to the, squall, the, the shelf cloud, uh, being literally a ramp, that's exactly what it is. It's the feeding area that this thunderstorm uh, gets its moisture and instability driven into it by. And then on the back side or underneath the shelf cloud 
is where that cold front comes in, and you, we, we experience the strong winds and, and, in some cases, wind damage. And these shelf clouds can take on lots of different shapes and, and sizes, and some of them can look more ominous than others, but you always need to remember that right underneath uh, that shelf cloud is where you get uh, the strongest winds. So let's keep talking about using radar during severe weather. And I, I've used this uh, before uh, in, in, in other webinars, but I think it's really important to remember because it's really easy to access radar nowadays to utilize the ability to loop that radar. Uh, looping that radar can tell you an awful lot about what's going on. Um, it may not necessarily be able to help you forecast something, but it can tell you an awful lot about what's going on and what the history has been. And this is the Cherry Stone tornado imagery from back in July of last year. And it's interesting to note that this storm, as it came into the bay, really didn't have a whole lot going for it. But once it got out into the bay, began to interact with that really warm water on the bay, it intensified very rapidly. So knowing the history uh, of a storm as it's being looped can be very effective. The other thing that looping allows you to do is it allows you to see things evolve and perhaps even anticipate uh, what might go on down the road. And let me give you an example here. What I want you to focus on with this loop is I want you to focus on this boundary that you can see starting in here. And it works its way down southward, uh, down near the North Carolina-Virginia border by the end of the loop. What I want you to focus on is this portion up here as it comes across the eastern shore. What you'll notice is, and this is the outflow boundary that we're seeing, is that the outflow is extending outward away from where the thunderstorms are. And when that happens, those thunderstorms tend to weaken. And you can see in this part of this squall line, those thunderstorms basically go away because they can't keep up with the speed of the outflow, and so their warm air uh, source gets uh, cut off, and they end up weakening. But further north, where you don't have the outflow outpacing the thunderstorms, those thunderstorms maintain their intensity. And then just to sort of look at, at boundaries again, I want to focus on uh, a couple of different boundaries here because there are lots of things that go on uh, when we talk about boundaries. Uh, the first one I want to focus on is this one up here with this cluster of storms that starts up here near Patuxent River. And you'll notice that that outflow initiates more thunderstorms just north and northeast of the Richmond area. And then the secondary boundary that you see that's coming east to west You'll notice that a couple of thunderstorms develop on it, which often happens with either sea breeze boundaries or outflow boundaries. And the last boundary that I want to focus on is this one that comes in at the very end. Even though there aren't any thunderstorms associated with it, earlier in the day there were. And so once you're able to see these boundaries, and, and you can see them in many cases on the radar data that's available on the Internet, it's very useful to keep an eye on these boundaries because they could well be the initiating or focal point for additional thunderstorm activity. All right, those are the things that I wanted to talk about with regard to uh, the science behind severe thunderstorms, and I'll be happy to take any questions at this point. So, Christy? Okay, Bill, this is Gene Stewart. How are you? Good, good. How are you, Gene? For you, only if I've seen it one time, and that is a gustano. Uh huh. What What is the difference between that and some of these severe storms and, and straight line winds that you're referring to? Okay. Um, Gene's brought up a term that we hear once in a while, um, and that's called a gustnado. The mechanics behind it are that the uh, winds associated with squall lines uh, can sometimes interact and sometimes produce uh, small-scale 
rotational signatures in damage. Um, sometimes we don't even see uh, visually uh, the gusnado form. Once in a while we do, but they're, they're relatively rare. And we, it's an attempt to try and explain how we can get damage that appears to be tornadic in nature in a situation where maybe the radar didn't show any rotation or the primary damage is uh, uh, straight line wind in nature. Um, they're more common out in the plains than they are here in the mid-Atlantic states, but every once in a while we'll have um, uh, experienced some, some gust NATO type damage uh, with, with stronger squall lines. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. If not, Bill, thank you so much for your presentation today. I know we all enjoy it when you do weather-related webinars, and they're always so interesting. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating today, and please don't forget to fill out the survey. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Bill.